Greetings! It's Maureen here on my Professor Agent Scully channel. The purpose of these short videos is to introduce concepts, readings, and assignments for my classes at UMass Boston. Please join me on this short learning journey. In this video, I'll talk about the culture lens. Next slide. We've covered the strategic design lens and the political lens. They help us understand a lot about the structures and roles in organizations, as well as the stakeholders, interests, conflicts, and negotiations that abound in organizations. Taken together, they might seem to offer a complete portrait of life in the workplace. However, there's often that something else, something almost intangible, which insiders seem to know about and newcomers have to figure out. That's what the culture lens reveals. If you break a cultural norm, and it might be even hard to know when you've done so, then even your best policy idea won't work and you'll get pushback. You might wonder, what went wrong? That's where it helps to understand the culture of an organization. Next slide. In thinking about culture, we might ask, when you enter an organization, can you sometimes detect a feeling about it that is hard to put into words? What norms, rituals, values make an organization distinctive? And this third question is just as important. What are the subcultures or dissonant cultures within an organization? Because culture can surely be more than one meaning system shared by everyone. For example, a software company may be well known for the polished salespeople who show up in nice suits to sell the software products to banking clients. But inside the organization, the programmers who write the code wear shorts and sandals, speak in their own shorthand, and even mock the people in suits. They have their own subculture. Or as another example, in a fast-paced work environment, there might be an unspoken norm that if you look really stressed out, you're probably highly productive. And then there might be that one manager who runs her own group counter to this norm so that work-life balance is valued and she actually gets really good results. So her group are dissidents. For each of our lenses, I offer a toolkit that helps you grasp the key elements of that approach and alerts you to things that you want to pay attention to as a manager. So up next, here's the toolkit for the culture lens. Next slide. This model to me is a great starting place to get a handle on cultures and organizations. It's not an endpoint because there can be layers of subcultures, dissidents, and nuances as we dig deeper into a culture. But this is a good place to start and also to identify what the dominant or overarching culture of an organization might look like. The model was advanced by Professor Ed Schein of the MIT Sloan School of Management. It presents a way to probe for elements of a culture. At the tip of this iceberg, you'll see artifacts. These are visible symbols that we can observe, although we'll likely need an insider to tell us why they are really significant. Digging a bit deeper are the values, which may be articulated explicitly on a website or on a plaque on the wall. The artifacts start to give us a sense of some of the values, some of which might actually be more taken for granted. And what about that sense of this is how things are just done here. Those deep logics that just make sense to people in organization as this is the way to do things. This is how to operate. That's where we dig to the most subterranean level to the assumptions. They may not generally be stated out loud, but they just make sense to people in organization. And if you trip up against one, you'll know. Well, maybe not to the subcultures or the dissidents, the assumptions may not make so much sense to them. They'll recognize the assumptions, but they may critique them, make some joking memes from them, expose hypocrisies or inconsistencies. Mapping the artifacts, values, and assumptions starts to give you the landscape of a culture. Next slide. Artifacts. That's a term we borrow from anthropology. Imagine an archeologist digging up artifacts to learn more about an ancient culture. That's the first thing they're likely to find, some artifacts. The artifacts are clues. They need interpretation. Does a large bowl signify 
Sharing food with a larger group that ate together? What do these artifacts mean? Next slide. Back to modern times, we can often find values stated explicitly on a website. No need to go digging for carved stone tablets to interpret the values. Here, for example, are the values as stated on the UMass Boston website. Did you know they were there? Have you ever looked at them? Inquiry, creativity, discovery, transformation, diversity and inclusion, engagement, environmental stewardship and sustainability, economic and cultural development, and urban commitment. To me, having been at UMass Boston since 2004, these really do ring true. If you visit the website, each one of these is more fully explained. Before moving toward what assumptions are about, let's pause now and consider a company that prides itself on having a culture that not just defines who they are, but drives what they do. Next slide. Zappos. I hope you watched the video in which founder and CEO Tony Shea explains what the culture of Zappos means to him and how he is deliberate about nourishing and preserving the culture. Next slide. The office space at Zappos has some of the first noticeable artifacts. It's colorful, expressive, idiosyncratic, fun. Although some might say it's dizzying and distracting. See, cultural artifacts don't have just one meaning, even in a fairly intense and unified culture like Zappos. Next slide. John Cotter made a blog post about the corporate culture at Zappos. Yes, that's the same John Cotter who wrote Our Iceberg is Melting, the parable about how deeply held cultural beliefs affect what appears possible. Here is what he writes about Zappos, and notice the passages I've highlighted in red. Those are some data points, so to speak, if you were trying to map the artifacts, values, and assumptions at Zappos. Zappos takes its corporate culture seriously. They have weekly office parades and institutionalized random acts of kindness to celebrate their corporate values, and their employees call their company a family. The website states, We've been asked by a lot of people how we've grown so quickly, and the answer is actually really simple. We've aligned the entire organization around one mission, mission to provide the best customer service possible. Internally, we call this our wow philosophy. Zappos believes that their fun traditions, their mission, and their attitude toward customers create a culture that is a key driver of their growth. See that last statement? That's a classic assumption their operating theory of how the world works. Next slide. So here is how I might map the artifacts, values, and assumptions at Zappos. Note that there is no one right answer in doing this. There's room for interpretation. And what makes a good cultural analysis is how compelling your interpretation is. One visible artifact would be the weekly office parades. The values are summed up here as provide the best customer service possible, and practice random acts of kindness. Values I've derived from what I'm reading and noticing here. But the company also has its own long formal list of value statements. The assumption, see how here it forms kind of a causal chain? It's their theory of how things work. Happy employees are productive, Happy employees treat customers kindly. All of that adds up to happy customers, repeat business, and it drives growth. Overall, notice how the three parts flow together, artifacts, values, and assumptions. The artifacts are a sneak peek into what the assumptions might be. The values undergird the artifacts and bring them to life. Together, it's a whole story of a culture, not three detached concepts. Next slide. Let's apply this model to an organization we all know, UMass Boston. We see two faces of UMass Boston in these contrasting photos. Stalwart brick institution from the 1970s era of expanding access to education and gleaming modern place to live and to get cutting edge education, be it in up-to-date science labs or other fields. Next slide. Ah, yes. You're probably chuckling already at the familiarity of these images. As insiders, we get it. We might have to explain to someone else. But to us, these are things that just say UMass Boston. 
When we're there on campus, we take them for granted. And when we're away, we might find ourselves missing them. See how the artifacts link to the values. The tea pass says access. The catwalk says access and metaphorically a pathway to going places, opportunities, things to do. I was actually looking for a photo with a hundred flyers on that catwalk. The steelworker statue, that says respect for work and workers. And of course, the many flags in the campus center are an artifact that signify a global perspective. These images tee up how we can think about what the assumptions might be. Next slide. So what are we all about at UMass Boston? What is our model for what we do and even why we exist? Those are the assumptions. The deep belief is that democracy works when everyone has an opportunity to get an education. That's why taxpayers chip in for public higher education. It's a public good that keeps our democracy healthy. And access and affordability don't make for less of an education. Excellence and access, these go together. That's our deepest commitment. That's why the shiny new buildings. Next slide. Assumptions stated in earnest naturally generate a backlash, a dissident view. Hey, wait a minute. Public education in the U.S. is too expensive to be considered truly accessible. In an organizational culture, if assumptions guide us to believe in what is right and true, then surely we'll push against those assumptions, test them, contest them in an effort to set things right again and to see if maybe the organization will deliver on what the assumptions seem to promise. When you dig deep to the level of assumptions, you can use your interpretive skills to see how members of an organization at once embrace cultural assumptions and test or mock the assumptions, especially if their experiences are not aligned with the assumptions. For example, if the dominant culture in a company tries to assert, we're all family here, and then there are layoffs, you can be sure someone will say, hey, you can't lay off your family members. Aren't we all in this together? Next slide. So, artifacts, values, and assumptions. Those are the focus of the assignment. Here it is in shorthand for UMass Boston. In writing, of course, you'd elaborate on the meanings and significance in a lot more detail. As I said earlier, this model, artifacts, values, and assumptions, is a great starting point. But then there are some frequently asked questions when we really start thinking about culture in a workplace setting. Just things for you to think about. Next slide. Can you change an organization's culture? What if you do not fit in an organization's culture? What if the company merges or is acquired? What if the organization's culture is toxic? These are good questions to ask if you're really using the culture lens. I'll give just a few very brief treatments of each one. Next slide. One, can you change an organization's culture? In general, no. Culture is its own organic thing. It gets sedimented in tradition. And you certainly cannot make a set of cheery announcements and assume you've changed the culture. That said, actions do speak louder than words. And new behaviors, especially from those who seem to have power, can grab attention and can start to shift a culture. A Pepsi company in Australia taught managers wanted to create a friendly, flexible culture where people did not feel that they had to stay late and ignore their families to prove that they were dedicated. So they launched a program called Leaders Leave Loudly to signal that it's okay if you're leaving at 4 p.m. for your kid's soccer game. Look, we're leaving at 4 p.m. loudly, not slinking out and hoping nobody will notice. Next slide. Two, what if you do not fit in an organization's culture? Creating an inclusive culture is part of a manager's job. What we studied earlier, employee resource groups, shows one way to address the issue of workplace cultures being more comfortable for some people to fit into than for other people. Employee resource groups work to make organizational culture more inclusive for people from diverse backgrounds by noticing what subtle cultural norms might keep some employees from feeling like they can fit in and succeed. Next slide. 
What if the company merges or is acquired? Only about 30% of mergers succeed. The failures are in part because the cultures do not blend. Zappos became a subsidiary of Amazon in 2009. It seems to have retained its distinctive culture. It can depend on whether the acquirer permits a company to retain some autonomy or tries to push it to blend in. However, there are some challenges to the Zappos culture now that they are part of Amazon. New programs are adding pressure, like Uber-style surge pay schemes, which have employees scrambling in a way that might undermine taking time for an act of kindness or having fun or lingering with a customer. Next slide. What if the company's culture is toxic? This is the Enron case, as captured in the movie Enron's Smartest Guys in the Room, which shows how a culture of risk-taking, showing off, celebrating the appearance of success and ignoring warnings led to a disastrous collapse. The movie is like a study of an organizational culture and a cautionary tale. Next slide. So that's our look at the world as seen through the culture lens. Some people might argue that the culture lens is sort of an add-on, an add-on to the other quote-unquote more serious lenses. Others would argue that a culture lens is the main lens. It tells you everything you really need to know about an organization. However you wish to align these three lenses, strategic design, political, and cultural, the idea is to have them all at your disposal so you can see through these lenses the things you need to see as a manager in order to make good decisions, anticipate reactions, and create good places to work. That's all for now. Thanks for joining me on this learning journey. And as always, be in touch if you have any questions.